Her story is not of an attack, but rather one of healing, courage. My story isn't about anger or fear or hatred or being a victim. Recovery. My recovery was a gift that I wanted to share. And it's been a gift to my mind, my body, and my spirit. Hope. It was a sense of taking back something that had been taken away from me. And it filled me with such hope. It was great. On April 19th, 1989, a young woman went for a run in New York Central Park shortly after 9 p.m. Hours later, two men wandering the park found her near death from a brutal beating and sexual assault. In a coma with 75% blood loss, a fierce blow to the head and severe exposure, doctors at Metropolitan Hospital worried that this young woman might not survive. You know, I have no memory of the horror of that night, of the violence, of the beating, of the feeling of, of helplessness, of powerlessness. Fourteen years later, Tricia Miley, known only to the world as the Central Park jogger, revealed her name and an amazing story of survival and recovery in her best-selling memoir, I Am the Central Park Jogger, a story of hope and possibility. Tricia Miley, I Am the Central Park Jogger, Courage, recovery, hope. It is now with great pleasure that I call to the podium our, 20, our 2018 Brooks Rehabilitation College of Healthcare Sciences distinguished lecturer, Ms. Tricia Miley. Well, thank you all for that warm, warm welcome. And as um, Jacksonville is now my home, I'm especially excited and really grateful that, that JU asked me to be a part of this series that really focuses on health and well-being. And I'd just like to give another extra special Thank you to Provost, I didn't realize that she had been promoted, Provost Sapienza, who reached out to me and invited me to be here tonight, and also your wonderful President Cost, uh, who has been an enthusiastic supporter all along. And you know, these amazing leaders that you have here really help to provide an exceptional educational experience. And I think Jacksonville is so fortunate that this university is filled with this kind of leadership. So we're all very lucky. Now, you know what I was thinking in that a little bit from, from the video in the introduction, you know some about me, and I'd love to get a better sense of the aud audience. So. Um, don't get nervous, but if, <laughs> um, if, if you're a student here at the Brooks Rehabilitation College of Healthcare Sciences, please raise your hand. See. Ah, wow, okay. So I think you're the majority. And, and how about if you're a student somewhere else at JU? Anybody? Oh, okay, we have a few. And how about faculty? Great. Um, you're all in the reserved seats. <laughs> and staff, but staff members, great. And, you know, because this is an institution of learning, I think my last category is going to cover everybody else here. There aren't too many of you left. But how many of you consider yourself students of life? But that's me, too. So, all right, I think. I think we, we do have everybody. Um, so, you know, for, for those at Brooks Rehabilitation College of Healthcare Sciences, it's quite a mouthful. Um, <laughs> I really do admire your career choice because 
I know what a difference your work is going to make to so many, just as it made for me over these past 29 years that I've you know, found the resilience to heal, reclaim my life, and move toward wholeness. And I think wholeness is our goal, whether we're recovering from trauma or trying to balance the emotional stresses of living. Whole is entire. It's complete. It's free of dis-ease. And I believe that healing is the process of moving toward wholeness. Healing isn't becoming exactly the same as we were. And we move toward wholeness, certainly through our physical health, but also through our emotional and spiritual health as well. And I want to, to highlight a really essential point that I'd, I'd love to leave you with tonight. And that is, every one of you here, and especially those who are in the, you know, the, the healthcare sciences, each one of you, all along the continuum of care, is going to be helping someone move toward wholeness. And tonight, I'll tell you about my journey by sharing stories of my recovery, stories that illustrate the art, or what I call the heart, of healing. I'll share four lessons that I learned that, that really did help me to find the resilience to, to reclaim my life as I healed and moved toward wholeness. And those lessons are, first, the importance of what we feed the psyche. Second, using the body to heal the mind. Third is the power of the present moment. And the last lesson has been the most difficult one for me, learning to accept myself post-trauma. So, you know, before I elaborate on these lessons, I think I'd, I'd like to do a short exercise kind of bring us all together. And it's a short breathing exercise. And I'm going out on the limb a little bit here. And you don't really know me. Some of you do. But, but uh, for those of you who don't, I'm going to ask you to trust me a little bit on this one. So I'm going to ring these bells and then ask you to follow your in-breath and your out-breath, the rising and the falling of your own breath and then I'll ring the bells again. So if we can make sure that our cell phones are off, and um, if you, you know, sit, sit up in your chair and uncross your arms and legs, and feel the support of that chair below you. And, and yes, thank you, we're, we're gonna lower the lights a bit. And if it's comfortable for you, you can close your eyes, or lower your gaze. As you breathe in, feel the air going through your nostrils, down your chest, and into your diaphragm or belly. On your out breath, feel your diaphragm relax as the air pushes up through your chest and out your nostrils. As I ask you to breathe in and out, please focus on the image that I give you. Breathing in, 
I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile to my body. Breathing in, I am a flower. Breathing out, I am refreshed. Breathing in, I am a mountain. Breathing out, I am solid. Breathing in, I am still water. Breathing out, I am reflecting truth. Breathing in, I am alive. Breathing out, I smile to myself. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Thank you. You can turn up the lights. And I hope you, you all feel a little bit more relaxed. And I think it's so nice that we can, we can access that, that feeling of calmness, of, of relaxation, uh, really so easily, whenever we want, and especially during stressful times. Now, of course, the exercise doesn't make the stress disappear. But when we're calmer, when we can tap into the stillness that exists around us, we can handle any situation that's in front of us with a more open mind. And I guarantee you the results will be better. So, put these back. And, and one other thing that I want to do, too, is, um, is to, before I elaborate on the lessons, is to tell you a little bit more about the condition I was in that started me on this journey. And in part, we're relaxed now because the story isn't a great one. And it was 29 years ago that I... Um, was living in New York City. And I went for a run after work uh, in Central Park, and I was attacked. And investigators you know, weren't sure if my head fractures came from a metal pipe, a brick, or a rock. I was dragged into a more wooded section of the park, tied up and gagged with my running clothes, beaten, raped, and left for dead. And I lay in those woods for several hours until I was finally found just by chance. And that night was a horrible one in the park. Uh, over 30 teenagers were roaming the park doing what was called wilding. And eight other people who were in the park that night were accosted or threatened in some way. And, you know, as, as was said on the video, um, people, you know, from all over the world heard about it. The story just captured the headlines, not only right there in New York City, but all over. And, and you know, people were just wondering you know, what did this savagery of the attack say about our society? Well, as a result of that severe beating to my head on that April 
it was April 19th of 1989, I suffered a traumatic brain injury that left me with extensive physical and cognitive dysfunction. After I was finally brought to the emergency department, my temperature was 85 degrees, hypothermic. My blood pressure, you know, we all want 120 over 80, was 70 systolic, that first number, and there was no hearing or feeling of the diastolic rhythm, that second number. And my left eye socket had been crushed in. And the force of the blows were so strong that a doctor much later told me that my eyeball exploded right through the thin plates of my orbital floor. And from the fractures, and the multiple deep lacerations and avulsions across my face, I lost 75% of my blood, so I nearly bled to death. I was in a state of profound shock called class four hemorrhagic shock, and a priest was called in to give me last rites. I was also in a deep, deep coma that lasted for 12 days. And on something called the Glasgow Coma Scale of 15 points that, you know, that's used to measure the level of a coma, I was given four points. And as a frame of reference, on that scale of 15 points, you get three points just for being alive. Now, miraculously, I survived. And as a result of the brain injury, I have absolutely no memory of any of the events from the night of the attack until just about six weeks later. So I actually don't remember going running, the attack, being raped, or most of the time in the acute care hospital in New York City, Metropolitan Hospital. So the first lesson I learned from being in this horrendous condition is the importance of the messages I received. Basically, what was, you know, what, what was given to my psyche. So when I was first there in Metropolitan Hospital, thankfully, my family and, and close friends were with me through the entire ordeal. But people from all over the world sent cards and letters and even gifts Children sent poems to me, and some people sent healing oil and holy water that nurses rubbed on me. And there was a makeshift memorial put up in Central Park where people left flowers, fresh flowers and notes. And I did get 18 roses from Frank Sinatra. And, you know, that apparently made my mother really, really happy. <laughs> So I, what I'd like to do is read a short passage from the book that talks about the effect of all of this on me. As for the cards, letters, phone messages, and presents, my family read and described them to me even when I was comatose. Pat Babb, who was one of my nurses in the ICU, when she held me in her arms, whispered of the support and told me of the gifts from around the world sent to comfort me and help me get better. Did I subliminally understand their words and gain strength from that unconscious knowledge? I'm sure of it, just as I'm convinced that the cards and letters I eventually could read and understand were a vital factor in my rehabilitation. Now, of course, no recovery was possible without the enormous skill of the medical staff. But was there more? Did I have thousands of friends working on my behalf? And I was hearing something else as well from the letters and cards, that I shouldn't be ashamed. A common reaction among rape survivors is self-blame. It's somehow my fault the survivor imagines, and the internalization of that belief leads to shame, self-doubt, and silence. Some survivors feel they must hide that they were raped, so the attacks go unreported. Well, secrecy was impossible for me. The whole world knew I had been raped. But to me, 
This was a benefit. You shouldn't feel ashamed, the messages were saying. We're ashamed at how you were treated. People didn't ostracize me because I'd been raped. Rather, they opened their hearts to me. And it was so important for me to get these messages, especially early on. And I have an incredible example of this that I didn't even know about until a couple of years after my, my book came out when I got an email just completely out of the blue. And it's such a powerful email that I'm going to read it to you. And I promise that's the last thing I'll read <laughs> tonight. But um, so it says, I was the charge nurse of the emergency room at Metropolitan Hospital the night of your attack. I was one of the first to hold your hand and to tell you that you were safe and going to live. I remember every detail of that night as if it was yesterday. I held your hand until you left the emergency room for the ICU. I had only a small part in your care and trials, yet I read your book as a proud father of one of his children who had gotten better after a long illness. I am honored to have known you, he writes, to have taken care of you and to have fought for you. Thank you for enriching my life. I always need to take a deep breath when I hear, hear those words. I don't consciously remember him, those comforting words, his holding my hand. But I do know that he had a profound effect on my unconscious body clinging to that thin thread of life that remained. And I was also getting a message, even when I was in a coma, that I was in charge, that I was an integral part of the recovery process. I want to share with you something that Pat Babb who, who was one of my nurses, told me. And she told me this many years later, actually when I was doing some research for the book. And Pat is this uh, very, very strong woman from, uh, from Jamaica who, who would hold, as I read to you, she would hold me in her arms when I became agitated to calm me down. And I so wish that I could mimic her beautiful West Indian accent. But you know what? That brain injury didn't suddenly give me that ability. <laughs> so you're just going to have to imagine it. And one of the things she told me that really annoyed her and she thought shouldn't be done was when physicians would come into my room and talk about my condition or problems over my bed. She thought that they should have gone to a conference room because she was concerned that I knew what they were saying. She said to me, you may not have been able to talk, but you could hear. There was nothing wrong with your ears. And besides, she told me, what's the point of saying she can't or she'll never or she won't? And she was afraid that I was going to believe them. So, as soon as the physicians would leave my room, she told me she'd go up to the head of my bed and say, don't pay them any mind. What do they know? <laughs> Are there any doctors, any MDs here? Uh, you're, you're, you're a hero. You're a trooper. And when I did begin to talk, she would ask me, who's the captain of the ship? And apparently I'd say to her, I am. And she'd say, you're absolutely right. You're the captain here. Nobody else is my boss. And you can do anything you want. So Pat was definitely a powerful voice. So all of these 
messages of support that I received when I was unconscious and conscious were confirmation to me that I wasn't alone, that I had done nothing wrong, that I wasn't to blame, and that I was responsible for my recovery. All of these messages gave me hope. And in hindsight, I realize that that's exactly what my psyche needed to feel. So the second lesson that, um, that helped me to, to find the resilience, really, to move toward wholeness is, you know, is using my body to heal my mind. Now, even with all of the support that was surrounding me, I remember a very frightening time at Metropolitan when I realized that something was very wrong. And this was about six weeks after the attack, because that's when I start to remember things, um, you know, after they happen. It's when on the hospital records it no longer said delirious. Um, so I, uh, I remember this, this one, one day there, there was a, a woman sitting in my room asking me questions, and it turns out it was a neuropsychologist. I didn't know it was a neuropsychologist then, but, and, uh, but that's who she was. And apparently she also had been there many times before asking questions, because that's what neuropsychologists do. They ask a lot of questions. So, as I said, I don't remember those other days, but I remember this particular session very well. She asked me to draw the face of a clock. Now, I had lost a lot of coordination in my hands, and I, I tried to draw a circle as best as I could. And then I thought I'd be clever in doing the spacing of the numbers, so I'd put a 12 on the top at first, and then a 6 on the bottom, and a 3 to the right, and a 9 to the left, and then tried to put the other numbers in you know, as evenly as I could. And I remember looking at it, and I thought, it's not a masterpiece, but I felt pretty good about what I'd done. Well, then the real test began. She asked me to draw 2 o'clock, and I froze. I could not remember which hand was longer, the hour hand or the minute hand. And I thought, if I get this wrong, she'll just think I'm stupid. And I felt so ashamed. I, you know, I couldn't tell her that I didn't know. But I came up with a solution. I thought, if I draw the hands the same size, she'll never know <laughs> how confused I am. Well. Many years later, I saw a hospital report of her analysis from that, you know, that session. And it said that I had misplaced the hand positioning on the clock. So my ruse didn't work. <laughs> so what was I feeling that day? I was scared. And, and I felt ashamed. I mean, because because of what I didn't know and what I couldn't do. I mean, everything had been taken away from me. I couldn't walk. I couldn't think or speak clearly. I couldn't really even tell time. You know, my condition really was a threat to my mood, to my level of self-confidence, to my sense of self-worth. So let me tell you how my body helped to heal my mind. Now, I spent just about seven weeks at Metropolitan, the acute care hospital, and then I was transferred to Gaylord Hospital in Connecticut for rehabilitation, and I was there for about five months. Pretty much unheard of these days. Um, but one of the most memorable days during my time at Gaylord was when I went running again for the first time after the attack. Just a couple of weeks after I started to walk on my own without using a wheelchair, Nelson Carvalho, who was the head of the physical therapy department, kind of casually asked me 
if I'd be interested in meeting with a group of people who, you know, who got together on the weekends to run. And I thought to myself, well, that was a pretty spontaneous question. But I learned later, no, uh, uh that wasn't spontaneous. I, I see a couple smiles, people know. Um, it was part of my care plan. I mean, my treatment team with, you know, my, my doctors and, and all my therapists, my PT, my OT, my speech therapist, my vocational therapist, my uh, recreational therapist, all met to talk about, as they met with all the other patients or for the other patients, talk, uh, talk about, you know, strategies of how to keep the progress going. So I realize now that they all knew just how much to push me. It turns out there was a chapter of an organization called the Achilles Track Club that met at Gaylord on Saturday mornings. And Achilles is an organization that has chapters all over the world that encourages people with all kinds of challenges to participate in running. Now, you know, at first, I was hesitant to accept Nelson's offer, I mean, or his in, yeah, invitation. I, you know, I thought, could I do this? Did I want to do it? But I felt comfortable with Nelson. I trusted him. And I thought, if he is going to be there, then it'll be all right. So one Saturday morning, I decided to join them. And there are four or five of us there that day. And I remember there was a man who was in a wheelchair, and there were a couple people who were on crutches, and there was a younger guy who had spina bifida. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, if they can do this with their challenges, then so can I. And the track, and I'll put track in quotations, because it was a quarter mile loop that went right through the hospital parking lot. Didn't even go around it, because that would have been too far. But it went through the, the parking lot. And you know what? It worked. And I remember it was a hot, humid Saturday morning in August of 1989. And Nelson and I started out. And you can imagine, just a few weeks after I had graduated from the wheelchair, I was definitely a bit wobbly. But it felt so good. I felt like I'd conquered the world, and it filled me with such hope. I was taking something back that had been taken away. Now, as Nelson and I approached the end of that quarter mile loop, my exhausted body saw what looked like, you know, it was a huge hill, like a Mount Everest in front of me, and, you know, and I was getting even more unstable. It's actually, the pavement just goes up a teeny little bit, but it didn't seem like that to me. But Nelson saw that I was getting you know, more unsteady, and he, he reached out, grabbed my arm to steady me, and the two of us finished the rest of the course together, and I had a big smile on my face. And, you know, um, seeing, seeing that that accomplishment really helped my level of, of confidence. And that helped when I would feel frustrated or discouraged. And I felt good about my, you know, my other successes, however small they were. And you know what, what I saw was that when I felt proud of myself, when I felt good about what I could do, that was a really strong motivator that kept me pushing, pushing to the edges of what was possible. And the best part about it is that, I swear, 29 years later, as long as I keep working at some things, I still see improvement. So what I saw in myself and in others, because I've stayed very active in Achilles, is that the confidence gained in reaching a physical goal can be transferred to, to accomplishments in other aspects of rehabilitation or in life. I mean, at, at home, at school, at work, or in relationships. And 
And uh, you know, as I said, when when um, you know when we feel good about ourselves, almost anything is possible. And I've been involved in some research that that shows that exercise is a tremendous motivator and self-esteem booster for those with brain injury. And I am also convinced that it's good for all of us. <laughs> you know, not just if you have a brain injury. Um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to think. I think I, that's, that's, that's my second lesson of anything else there with, with the power of the body to affect, you know, what's going on in your mind. And my, my third lesson that has really helped me to move toward wholeness is when I realized the power of the present moment, that paying attention really matters, and that all I can affect is the present. And this lesson happened really very naturally, instinctively, without my being aware of it. And to me, that makes it that much more powerful. So let me give you an example. I told you that I had lost a lot of coordination in my hands. And an exercise that I did while I was at Gaylord to regain my manual dexterity was something that they called put the nail in the hole. So I was given this block of wood. It was probably about a foot and a half long and maybe an inch and a half deep. And it had holes drilled in it. And some of those holes were filled with nails, you know, standing upright, and other holes were empty. And my task was to take a pair of tweezers and transfer as many nails as I could from those filled holes to the empty holes in a given amount of time. And my occupational therapist, her name was Mary Zach, I remember them all, <laughs> she stood there with a stopwatch. And I did that exercise over and over again. First on my right hand, and then, of course, she made me do it on my left hand. And I did that exercise with such intensity that my mother once said to me when she was watching that she couldn't believe that I did it with such concentration and patience. She told me that it would have driven her absolutely crazy. But at that moment, that's what I focused on, what I could affect the task that was right in front of me. I wasn't spending time getting caught up in what had happened, a past I couldn't change. Resentment about the attack didn't grab hold of me and block my healing. I didn't wallow in what ifs or if onlys, and amazingly, I wasn't preoccupied with a fear about the future. I looked at the reality that was mine, which was not good, but I worked as hard as I could to make that reality as good as it could be. If I wanted to regain the full use of my hands, wallowing in the past or worrying about the future was not going to help. Working in the present moment was the right place to focus my energy. And I still remember a day showing the results of all of those exercises. My vanity returned, and I wanted to put mascara on. And I was able to do it without getting it all over my eyelids. So that was a real sense of accomplishment for me. Now, I'd mentioned that you know, this, this lesson kind of happened naturally. Well. Before the attack, I had never heard that expression, present moment. But as a result of my injuries, I found that I had to pay attention to, to be mindful of what my mind and my body were doing. I had to because nothing came naturally. I was in the midst of relearning. And that realization, you know, is something that I still keep in, in the front of my mind today. And, you know, when we're facing adversity, we can often feel helpless, 
out of control, like we have no options. By working in the present moment, we can ask ourselves, what can I do right now to make the situation better? And just by asking that question, what can I do right now? We regain control. We take responsibility. And that can change a feeling of helplessness into hope. Now, the last lesson that I want to share with you, I mentioned is you know, one of the most challenging or difficult for me. And it's you know, learning to accept myself post-trauma as I am. One of the most difficult consequences of the attack has been coming to terms with the deficits I suffered. I have lingering physical deficits, like no sense of smell and some double vision, and sometimes some problems with balance. But the hardest deficits for me to accept were the cognitive ones. I come from a family that really valued education and intellect. And I was proud of my academic achievements. As I grew up, many spoken and unspoken messages reinforced that smart was good. So could I still, you know, could I still meet the standard that was ingrained in me? Could I accept myself with these deficits? Well, in the early days after the attack, doctors weren't sure if I'd regain any of my cognitive abilities. But, you know, fortunately, I made great progress and the remaining deficits are subtle. But I always doubted myself and my abilities, always second-guessing assignments, wondering if I should have been able to do them better or faster or in a more complete way. It brought up old concerns. Would people take me seriously? Would they listen to me? I mean, the brain injury made me face this pre-brain injury challenge of self-doubt and multiplied it by about a thousand times. I needed to face this aspect of my healing, this dragon. So, you know, while I was at Gaylord, I had taken two of those neuropsychological exams and if you don't know what a neuropsychological exam is, hope that you keep it that way. <laughs> it's, um, I can tell from the laughter that some of you know. It's um, an extensive battery of tests that measures nearly every aspect of your cognitive ability. It takes a few hours you know, to, to, to complete it. So I'd taken two of them at Gaylord, and I even came back a year after I left uh, in 1990 to take another one. And the results of the, te the test were OK, and I was functioning well, but that test haunted me. And I think for understandable reasons. I mean, who of us wants to quantify lost intellectual capability? Well, I had been told that I didn't have to repeat the exam if I didn't want to. So on one level, that was a huge relief. But on another level, you know, I wondered about it. I think almost at, at a point, you know, below my consciousness. So let me, let me tell you about finally facing that fear. So this was in the spring of 2001, 12 years after the attack. I found the courage to finally face the question that I had run from, that I, that I was fearful of. How measurable was the damage that the attack had wrought? I decided to schedule another appointment for an evaluation at Gaylord. Well, the results of the test showed nothing dramatic. You know, nor did I honestly think that I would find out anything dire. And also, as I suspected, I had made gains in such areas as attention span and recall and cognitive ability in the intervening years. But it will always take me longer to process information than I once could. 
I don't pick up on complicated narratives quickly. I mean, sometimes some movies or even TV shows can be hard for me to follow. And I'll give you an example that dates me. But um, so how many of you remember West Wing from a number of you? OK, there are a few. So I, I mean, I really liked watching that show because it was, it was a great test for me uh, you know, to, to concentrate and follow all the different storylines. But I realized, you know what, it's because they talk so darn fast on the show. That Alan Sorkin, you know, that's one of his techniques, I think. Um, but um, anyway, it, it, was a, it was a good test for me. Something else, too, for me is, you know, when, when too much is going on, my ability to concentrate and, and prioritize can be affected. So mentally, I will never be the same as I was before the attack, before the brain injury. So, you know, acknowledging this to myself is, you know, to say the least, not a great feeling. But in another way, it gives me peace. I accept it. I can live with it. It's a giant step in my healing. It's part of the woman I've become and most days, I like that woman. So what's been the, the effect of, of these four lessons in, in my you know, managing the dramatic changes in my life and, and helping me to find that resilience to move toward wholeness? And again, those lessons are the importance of what we feed the psyche, the, the use of the body to heal the mind, the power of the present moment, and learning to accept myself. Well, I've got one last example that, that really captures these four lessons that I want to share with you. So I will tell you one more story. So this was six and a half years after the attack. On the first Sunday in November of 1995, I ran the New York City Marathon. And as I, as I ran those last miles through Central Park, I felt the support from strangers cheering all of us runners on. I felt proud, so proud of the hard work that had gotten me there. And in that moment, I had reclaimed my park, and I knew that I would finish. After I nearly lost my life in that park, after doctors had predicted that I might never regain my mental or physical capabilities, I crossed that finish line in four and a half hours with a huge smile on my face. Now, when I came to rehab in a wheelchair with severe cognitive dysfunction, I wondered, will I ever walk again? Will I ever be able to understand and remember a story I read? Will I be able to function like I did. Well, part of the healing process for me was learning to accept some new limitations, yet know in my heart that some of those limitations were temporary. Healing didn't mean becoming exactly the same as I was before the brain injury, but coming to terms with what I had and what I didn't have and moving forward with my life. For me, it was a process of learning to begin again. So what my journey has told me is that healing is in part a science with, you know, with all the tremendous advancements that we continue to hear all the time uh, you know, in the, in the medical field, I was going to say the scientific field, in the medical field. But it's also an art. 
And reclaiming wholeness melds those two aspects, the science and the art of healing, to nurture the possibility of the human spirit. And I, I know that many of you have seen how that human spirit is a pretty amazing thing. So, you know, you might ask, well, what's the art that I'm talking about in it? It's the art of seeing, as many of you will, of you students in here, it's the art of not only seeing, but, but, but caring for the whole person. It's the art of motivating a person to push, push to the edges of what's possible, yet know not to push too far and risk discouraging them. It's the art of seeing people like me at our worst, our most vulnerable, yet you know, developing a relationship of absolute trust. And that level of trust is essential to the healing process. Your, your support, and I'm going to add love, your love and support, your care, your trust, helps to create an environment that unleashes a resource, a power we each have deep inside to heal or come to terms with whatever our situation is. For with that love, that support, that care, and that trust, there is hope. And from hope, possibility emerges, no matter how dire the situation. To me, this is what keeps life moving forward as we heal. So I want you to remember that essential point I, rem I, uh, I talked about at the beginning of my comments, that each one of you in this room, you have that power that to, um, you know, that, that power, that, 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 that power to play, a, to play an important part in creating that environment that helps others move toward wholeness. And the fact that I'm able to stand in front of you this evening is proof to me that your love, your support, your care and your trust that you'll give with such passion and compassion what I call the heart of healing really does make a difference. So thank you all so very, very much.